Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 134 of Two Minute Talk Tips, the podcast that opens with a practical public speaking tip in the first two minutes before getting into a deeper discussion about public speaking. Today's tip comes to us from special guest Corey Truax. The most important thing is that confidence is earned. So the, the thing a lot of public speaker people tell you is you got to be confident. When you walk up the stage, when you walk up to the mic, you have to own the room and dominate the room. You've got to be confident when you get on stage. But I would say to a public speaker, if you've not prepared, if you've not done the work in, in, the, in advance, don't dare be confident. Uh, you should be very nervous if you've not done the work. So if you're reporting that last quarter's numbers and you've not mastered that uh, you've not mastered that material before you step up in that boardroom. Oh, be, be nervous. Don't be confident. But if you have, be confident. Be confident that you're no one in this room knows more than you do about this topic. So my, my number one actionable, uh, actionable tip is if you're going to be a good public speaker on stage and at the mic, you must first be a great public speaker at your desk, at your computer, by yourself doing the practice. And if you'll do all of that, you should be supremely confident when you get up on that stage that no one can talk about what you're about to talk about better than you can. Stick around. And after the break, we'll hear more from Corey Truax. Welcome back. Corey Truax's day job is in admissions at the University of South Carolina. He supplements that with secular and religious speaking gigs uh, and on-air work at WLFJ Radio in Greenville, South Carolina. His story is one of building. I mean, he didn't become a speaker by jumping onto the biggest stage he could find. He assembled this life in little pieces, beginning back in school. And then he began volunteering to speak and chaining together event after event after event as people would see him speak and then invite him to speak at their event. And that's the journey we talk about today, about taking small steps forward that lead to bigger and bigger things and doing a lot of work in the process. So now, let's meet Corey. So Corey, thanks so much for joining us on Two Minute Talk Tips this week. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So you're uh, doing a lot of speaking as part of your day-to-day life uh, and career, which is awesome. But what is your earliest memory of speaking to or performing for a group of people? For a lot of folks, I think the first stage you're on is the church stage, especially where I grew up in the American Southeast. That church stage ends up being the first one. Uh, So we're talking as early as six or seven years old in Sunday school settings, uh, speaking to kids and then going through the next preteen years and adolescence into the teen years, always being in front of my peers in that church setting. Yeah, that's awesome to have those opportunities early on. What I think is also really interesting is that a lot of folks get that early exposure, but it's only a few of those folks who go on to lead those teen groups and continue speaking with them on a significant basis, whereas even others who attend and love to participate will not necessarily take on that particular leadership role because they're not as comfortable with it. Yeah, I've noticed that too, but I also noticed for me early that I loved it. <laughs> the The adrenaline of a microphone, the adrenaline of a stage, uh, even for, for Christmas now, I'm often given microphone paraphernalia. People give me old microphones and make decorations. <laughs> Because I've been doing it for a long time. I've always loved it. It's not for everybody. Uh, but I had a natural inclination to continue to be on a stage. And so that ended up growing through school and in college. And then even with – like, uh, let's go with part-time jobs in high school, finding those ways where I will do the – I'll do the talking for the group. That's awesome. And to find that early on and to gravitate towards that um, – one of, the, one of the great things about when you are comfortable on a stage, it opens up so many more opportunities for you. Uh, I remember when I was interning many years back at the uh, Montana Lottery and we were going to state fairs and doing shows. I ended up, you know, with a mic in my hand prom- promoting drawings at the booth for like six hours at a shot. 
Oh, I, I had the same thing where just one thing turns into another, where uh, let's say a parent, right? My day job is at a university. A parent comes and sees one of my presentations, and I, I had one who worked for a hospital who decides, I need to get that guy to be our master of ceremonies for this fundraiser. And so then I show up and become a master of ceremonies for that event. And then someone at that event had, I, uh, I can't remember what they had me do. It was a, like a, it was a women's club. I can't remember what that women's club was raising money for, but then you just go on and host the next thing. And so you're right. The folks who are willing to get on a stage, prepare and do it well, it tends to be those opportunities start to pile on top of each other because of someone in that audience. Yeah, exactly. And why it's so important to do it well and to, you know, build a reputation of someone who's going to be good to work with. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, the thing we can't do is people who on stages with microphones. Too many of us are often prima donnas. Too many of us often have some egotism to being the person on stage. Man, when you run into the person who is good on the stage, good with public speaking, but also good to people, easy to work with, uh, those folks are going to continue to get booked and invited to be a part of things. Exactly. So so as you're doing all these different uh, presentations and all these different talks, what are you typically doing in that five minutes before you go ahead and take the stage? I am all about the intro. So five minutes before I am reciting my intro. Uh, this is uh, one principle for me in public speaking. I won't speak in any setting without having rehearsed it at least twice. Uh, out loud by myself in a room, not just going through the outline, but actually rehearsing word for word. So in that five minutes previous, I am rehearsing the introduction, what I consider to be the most important part, so that when it's, and please welcome Corey Truax, I just go right back into where I was in that rehearsal. And that's awesome, because that's when you have the most of the audience's attention. Yeah, that's such a great, great point. If you're ever going to have uh, your, the majority of an audience or vast majority of it, it's that first 10 seconds. Uh, and so in those five minutes previous, I am by myself quietly going through whatever that hook is going to be. And that becomes also uh, has the added benefit of giving you that sort of focus and that sort of ritual that really helps you switch your body and your mind and your voice into that. OK, now it is speaker time. You're so right, especially tone. Because the tone I bring to a stage is significantly different, I think, than what I bring to an individual conversation. And that previous five minutes of focus and rehearsal says, right, here, here, here you're about to be that, uh, that entertainer. Here you're about to be that engaged personality. And it even changes uh, vocal inflection and all that, all of those factors in the public speaking. So, yeah, that five minutes before, rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal of the introduction. Yeah, and that shift in tone, I think, is one thing a lot of folks who who don't speak uh, in front of groups don't nec don't necessarily understand. They see that folks on stage are a as these outgoing folks, these big extroverted folks who are always going to be the life of the party. And when you start talking to more and more speakers, you realize many of them, or even most of them, are not. They tend to be the introverts who are going to be fantastic in front of 500 people, but you put them in a group with three people and suddenly they become much less adept at speaking to that group and speaking to those folks. <laughs> I am 100 percent with you. And that's me. That's my story. Give me a thousand people. Don't give me two. <laughs> the, and I've de developed that giving me the two people and just inter interpersonal. But public speaking is ultimately a performance. And I love performance. A lot of us public speakers do. But you take that even to the music world, take it to authors, take it into movie stars and actors. A lot of them are introverted. We, we find our energy by ourselves. But once the lights come on, once the mic is on, once it's time to put on the performance, we can perform. Uh, but I, I agree with you. People have misinterpreted me, not necessarily as rude, but just as someone who is oddly quiet, you know, because you're such an outgoing person. Like, no, I'm not. I was I was the one supposed to be talking like they put the mic in my hand. As soon as the mic is out of my hand, I don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> you know, so, and, and so that, that ends up being who we are. Uh, it's a misconception for public speakers that we're all outgoing, happy, slappy people. And what's really, uh, really awesome about that, too, is that for introverts out there who are not speaking, but might kind of like to relax, you can do it. Yes. Oh, yeah. Because uh, with the in I actually think introverts might have something of an advantage here and that you are willing to spend some time alone uh, that that preparation 
for public speaking. I think that's the difference between a good public speaker and an excellent one is the one that is willing to sit down by themselves and practice, sit down by themselves and prepare. And the, the introvert often being by themselves has that opportunity. Yeah, that is uh, that is a fantastic point. So, you know, you obviously love the stage. We've been talking about that. Uh, you've actually been able to make your passion for speaking fit into your career pretty well then. How does yes. it support your career? If I did not have this skill, I don't know how I would earn a living um, because I have very few. There are very <laughs> few things I do well. Uh, and so it was important to find a, uh, a career where my ability to get onto stages and make compelling points, compelling arguments and presentations it was a way I could actually get paid to do it. Um, so it's integral to what I do with the university level where I am often the face of the university, where I get sent to high schools, where I get sent to uh, to college uh, fair type of scenarios where there's a lot of people on stage for just five minutes at a time. Uh, so I, it's been integrated into other stuff I do. I mean, I oversee our admissions team and I'm part of some of the marketing decisions, but I, I don't think I would have continued my promotion through this industry without having been a person on the stage, getting that sort of attention as the pitch man, the man who can go on stage and make that compelling case. So as aside from the, the stage time you get, what is it you really enjoy about being an admissions counselor and running the admissions team? You know, as with a lot of, I, mean, I consider admissions counselors from most places to be salespeople. I, that's what I consider myself to be. You know, if you're not at one of the big name brand universities, then you're really selling high school students on the the quality uh, and what you're offering at your institution. And with most sales environments, your better salespeople end up at middle management. That's where I found myself here about 10 years into that career where I was doing admission. I'm still kind of an admissions counselor, but I uh, moved on into uh, another role. Um, but what I love about it the most is there is – at the place where I work – we do tend to serve a lot more first-generation kids, uh, some kids who've never had a family member go to college. We tend to serve – I think we still serve the, the fireman's kid and the policeman's kid and the teacher's kid. We still serve the kids and families that sometimes struggle um, even, you know, to pay for it and all that. Um, so I do love that part. I love that uh, I get to do something that connects folks who are intimidated by a process. I get them to a spot where they're not intimidated anymore. Where, where they know they can they can do this thing that they thought was out of their reach. Hmm. That's awesome. Uh, and, you know, it's a great way to help not only um, the kids, but also the broader community that they're a part of, their family community and their local community, at seeing what the next stage of their life can be. Yes. Yeah, even with that, you know, missions counseling, I say it's a sales job, but if those who are honest with what they do, I've also talked to plenty of kids – out of going to the university where I work. I've talked them into uh, going to some other places or going to a technical college, going to a trade school because it was better for them. And so when you're part of higher ed, the part that I'm in, this ambitions part, that's something you can do. I mean, you really can have some kind of impact on that community around you, uh, helping people fit in to the economy, to the culture that they're going to be in as professionals. Uh, and that that's so important. So, right product for the right for the right person is is the key to success in uh, sales and marketing, and especially in ethical sales and marketing. Right. Yeah. There's plenty of non non ethical sales and marketing. Actually, it's one of the big annoyances. I feel like some of the folks who are most successful are the ones doing it the least ethically. Uh, but if we are going to be good ethical business salespeople, uh, yes. Um, even when your product doesn't match that person's need, be willing to say, to say so. And uh, refer them to what serves them best. So one of the other interesting aspects of this sales role is that it sometimes it's not just about, uh, you know, obviously you want the you want the kids for whom it's going to be a best match to come to the university. Uh, if it's not going to be a good match for them, you want to help them find a place where they are going to uh, be more effective. But there's also that other uh, ground, that sort of middle ground that many admissions folks deal with is that sometimes there's uh, the kids who want to go to that university and maybe it is could potentially be a good fit for them, but 
they may not obviously be qualified for it. So how can high school kids use their use public speaking to better catch the attention of admission staff, either at your school or at other schools, to improve their odds of getting in where they want? Oh, that's a great question, uh, especially for the highest or at least the most competitive places. Uh, I'm in the I'm in South Carolina, so I'll just use our big public university here. Uh, Clemson University is the biggest one in South Carolina, and they're reporting this year over 20,000 applicants. They're taking just over 4,000 freshmen. So we're talking about a lot of people being told no. Uh, and so uh, some of the places in the colleges out there aren't that competitive. You know, they're not in that situation. But where students are looking to be competitive at these highly selective places, those roles they look for are often the leadership. And bottom line, at the high school level, a lot of time that those leadership roles go to those who can get on stage, who can do the public speaking thing. Uh, so the student who will develop that gift and that talent can then lead organizations and add to that resume, add to that application. Here is my, uh, here's my qualification. I'm leading this organization. I've been a leader in my high school, but the way they became a leader was by being an effective public speaker. And there's lots of then opportunities for those those kids to go ahead and do that, whether that's going to be acquiring those skills through um, through their church as, as they're growing up, whether that's going to be participating in theater or high school uh, speech and debate or forensics or student council or these other activities. It's yes. about you get that attend, you get that those shots. You got to go up and you know, to make that baseball analogy, you need to get those at bats. You need to get those hours in front of the group. Even if you're not the best speaker, the fact that you are getting those hours, you're getting that time in and you're putting yourself out there. It, it seems like that's where some of the real value is. Yeah. You've got to get the reps in if you're going to be effective, uh, it, not just with the selection process for a lot of these universities, uh, but I think of some of the other colleges that I've interacted with. Uh, the King's College in Manhattan, there in New York, or uh, Jane, I think it's uh, James, James Madison, I think in Virginia. Some of these places have scholarship competitions that are based totally on public speaking competitions, where you come and give your 12-minute, 15-minute speech on a given topic, uh, and you're going to uh, find yourself saving a lot of money because you were effective at these things. Uh, so some universities and certain models reward you for being a good, a good public speaker with actual scholarship dollars. Yeah, and, and and that's awesome. I actually paid for part of my uh, education over at Carroll College on a speech and debate scholarship back in the day. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the kind of thing I mean. If you can develop these skills, uh, there's all kinds of rewards in the college world for it. So a lot of it, uh, we talked about the preparation and you know speaking in high school and whatnot. It's a great way for kids to prepare themselves for college, for opportunities, for scholarship potential and really just for leadership in general and admission to competitive places. But a lot of it, as we said, it is all about preparation. And when it's time to build a new talk, what is your process for going out and creating a new talk? My first question is always uh, the deliverable to the audience. If you're not, if, at least in my estimation, my opinion, if you're not first focusing on who your audience is, you're probably starting from the wrong spot. And so whenever I'm asked to develop something new, uh, that's my first question. Who's going to be there? What do they want? What are they expecting? How, how can I serve them well that at the end, when I'm walking off that stage, will they have estimated me as having served their purposes properly uh, and met their expectations or exceeded them? Uh, so when I am building one, my first thing is who's listening? What do they need? What do they want? What do they expect? Uh, once I have decided that in terms of content, I continue to let the audience dominate because that audience is going to dominate then. Well, how? Is this group particularly going to respond well to illustrations and stories? Is this group going to respond particularly well to statistics instead of anecdotes? Is this group going to respond really well to a particular type of visual aid or uh, or even my own pers my own personality? Do they need the more serious version of me that builds credibility or do they – or are they going to respond better to the funny and jocular version of me that more engages them? Uh, and so through the content to method and organization, always coming back to who's listening and what are they, what are they needing from me? Yeah, you know, that focus on the audience and 
Because ultimately, you're only successful if the audience does what you're asking them to do. Right. I, I measure them. Um, I get. I mean, I actually get to have some formal measurements that I. I don't know that everyone loves this, but I enjoy the fact that a great deal of mine on campus presentations end with people being handed an evaluation, and they evaluate one to five my presentation on a bunch of different metrics so that I can go back and look at what those people said. You know, in an open house setting, there's 300 people in a room, and then I get to go back and look and see what they said. Uh, and so that audience feedback and audience focus uh, helps to hone that message. Right, right. I, th- I think some of the biggest value in those types of surveys, too, and that kind of feedback comes not from looking at the ratings from any one person. But when you've got a group of 300 and you can look at them uh, overall, you know, averages, medians, means, all of that stuff, that's where you can start seeing some of the interesting data because that takes some of the, you know, the quirky individual prejudices out of the rating and can give you some actual valuable feedback. Oh, yeah. I actually tell all public speakers who are going to be evaluated because, again, I oversee our admissions people now, uh, so the the sales people on the ground, and sometimes they've got to speak in public. I tell them immediately, every time, whoever was nicest to you, throw out that review, <laughs> and whoever was meanest, throw out that review too because neither one of those people were realistic. Somebody thought you were better than you were, and somebody else was just bitter and mad about something else. <laughs> so uh, one that's one word I would give to anyone doing public speaking. Your harshest critic is wrong, and your biggest cheerleader, probably wrong too. Uh, the truth is somewhere in between. Right. I think that's how they uh, score Olympic diving, isn't it? <laughs> Throughout the high score yes. and the low score. That's right. That's a great point. I didn't think of that. It's a great sports analogy. <laughs> yeah, and then what's also really neat is when you can take that data and look at it over time. Look, Compare the numbers you got um, in uh, this month to the numbers you got a year ago in this month and see how that has changed over time. Cause it's very difficult. You're generally, generally you're going to get better. The more that you do a thing, yes. um, there are exceptions of course, but you know, you don't see it at the time. You don't see those subtle improvements. You don't see that, you know, 0.5% growth in, in improvements. But once you start looking at it over the course of a year or so, then you can really start to see those numbers improving and growing. Or sometimes you see a number declining and you realize at that point, okay, I was doing something different before. I need to get back to that. Or for I, when I have found that, because I will admit, I have found that. I have found looking at my own data, the, the line showing I am becoming less effective. And I, what I found in that situation is that I did not catch that my audience was changing. I didn't catch that over these two or three years, the people who were coming in to, to see those open houses, the, the, the landscape of the college world had changed. There had been some different media inputs. And so some of my emphases were the wrong ones. And they were relevant for the audience three years ago, but this audience changed on me, and I didn't even realize the audience changed. Uh, so, yeah, reevaluation is a good thing. Uh, that introspection to figure out, am I, am I assuming that my audience is the same one that it was last year? Or has anything changed with who I'm talking to? Right. Uh, events in the news and all of that can have a major impact, especially when you're talking to a younger audience. I mean, it's one thing to think I look back and look at what I was doing and what I was aware of five years ago and – um, and that's fine. Yeah, there's not a whole lot that has changed. It's only been a relatively short amount of time. But in the case of your audience, five years can be 30% of their life. Right. That is that's different. A great point. So these kids specifically, I mean, if we're getting into higher ed, the, the media landscape regarding the value of college, it has drastically changed in the last, let's go 10 years? From 2008 to 2018, the messaging around college and media has really been different. And so you have to respond to it, respond to the fact that, well, here are some voices that these students, these parents have heard. You can't pretend they haven't heard those voices. You need to respond. And that, that's likely relevant for all kinds of different salespeople and uh, whatever your audience is trying to realize, well, what have they heard? The topic I'm about to talk about, whatever the topic is, what do they already know? What are their assumptions? What do I need to address? 
And I, I failed to do that for a little while and was able to come back and respond to it. Yeah, that is so important. And even, you know, their basic expectations. If you're talking about, you know, the idea that you're able to actually integrate computers into some of the learning and be, had was that was innovative 10 years ago, that's just expected today. Yeah, if you're if you are like we'll go with my my industry. If you are selling the fact that you can have ebooks in class, like you're not interesting. <laughs> they're, they're hearing that everywhere. This is like a car salesman saying that the cars have air conditioning. Like, yeah, well, we know it's 2019. We, we all we all have air conditioning. Right, right. Uh, when I was uh, teaching people to sell computers, we went through a lot of that, especially in the early 2000s, where we we're introducing Wi-Fi and wireless connection connectivity, you know, and, and how powerful this is. And that was a, a big part of, you know, our training. But, you know, six, seven years later, if you're talking about how you have Wi-Fi, I, it, it's like when it, it makes no sense. They, they just assume yes. that it's like you drive along the highway now and you see a hotel with a billboard that says color TV like what <laughs> this is a, gr a great point about those audiences i mean for some folks it is i'm sure the audience is just uh it's just other people at work it's colleagues it's it's reporting quarterly numbers but these are those those things to think about that some of the stuff you j you report it's just assumed and it's just not relevant anymore to bring up uh and so th this is a I think this is a challenge for certain public speakers, certain types, of, or at least different um, audiences, is we have this awesome speech, this awesome pitch, and man, it goes well, and it's super effective. And once it's gone well and it was effective, we just stop thinking about it. We don't ever reevaluate it because, well, you know, it worked. It worked in, two, it worked in 1999. It worked in 2009. Uh, and we don't have that healthy uh, retrospection and introspection or even circumspection to look around and wonder, I wonder if it's still effective or if, or it, if or it could be better. And and then where it can become, especially insidious too, is if you have that perspective and then you teach someone else that perspective of how to do it that was really successful in 2009, and then they learn to do it that way, and then they teach someone else. By the time you eventually you get to the point where nobody knows why we're doing it in this particular outdated way, it's just the way that everybody was taught, even though it no longer makes sense. Yeah, I actually, uh, so I'll give myself as an example of a negativity here because I do most of the training. I, once I realized something I was saying the way I was saying it was not effective, was becoming irrelevant. Well, then I got to go back and tell everybody, hey, that thing I taught you, my bad, because it it infected how everyone said it, because that's how I would have told them to say it. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, we got to be careful about that. One, one of the ways I've addressed that is by making sure I'm also listening to other people, uh, if, especially if they're trying to explain the same information I am. Well, I want to hear how they're saying it, because maybe they've come up with something better. Maybe they're, they're doing something more creative and they've updated they've updated it. That's that's another part of public speakers, at least for me. I struggle with humility, and hmm. some of us got to get to that spot where we're just humble enough to go. Maybe I'm not the best at this. Maybe someone else has a better idea. I'm I'm going to go be humble and learn from someone else. Yeah, the applause you get can be um, can 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 be dangerous at times. It's oh, it's intoxicating, man. <laughs> I mean, it, it got to me maybe more than some others. Like I, I'll admit. I, I really get an adre adrenaline rush off of getting on that stage, seeing at least 90% of those eyes engaged in what I'm saying. Is there, is there a better feeling than telling a joke on stage and people laugh? Uh, like these are the, I, I don't know a better feeling. Like it's incredible. <laughs> and so you get to that feeling um, and then it can make you think, man, I'm the best at this. And while, while there's got to be confidence to be a good public speaker. You got to cycle back around to go, but it could, you know, you could always learn. You could always learn from somebody else. It, it, it's like, like in everything else, whether we're talking about spe uh, speaking and getting audience response to food, to, you know, drinking, to all these other things in, in, in all these, in all, in all things, moderation is key. Yes, it's great. That's a great point. So we've been talking a lot about the the high school audience, and and that's one of the audiences you speak to a lot. You also speak with your university team, the colleagues that you manage, uh, colleagues at various industry conferences. How does your approach to all these different audiences differ? 
right back to that uh, question about having having to build a talk, build a presentation, uh, just knowing what they want from me. Um, so for, for example, the high school students, uh, before I get to the individual ones, I think this is one universal. Universally for me, one of my primary goals in a talk that doesn't differ across audiences is creating confidence. One of the things I want to do first for anybody is I want to convince them I know what I'm talking about. I am an expert in this field. I've done the work. You can trust what I'm about to say with a command of the of the issue, a command of the information and the subject matter. Um, but then you can get a little bit more specific to like for the high school students and their parents. Most of them are scared out of their mind when they walk on campus. They are intimidated by this process. And so one of the things I want to commute to them, uh, communicate to them is you don't have to be intimidated by this. If you if you're on this campus and you've been accepted, you're already smart enough. Like you're none of the kids walking around you are a lot smarter than you or more special. So one of the one of the strategies when you're talking to the high school students is I just want to build you up some to take away some of the things you're nervous about. Uh, when it's uh, when it's my own people on campus, uh, I think it's more inspiration. Um, we we tend to have plenty of experts in their field, but then you, you lack motivation. You can have all the ability to do something, but then you you struggle in the motivation to do it. And so my tone or the stories or whether I'm giving statistics versus anecdote, that's going to change because I'm trying to motivate these folks. Or I was trying to. Uh, take the intimidation factor off of high school people for my university colleagues. I want to motivate them, inspire. Uh, and then for the, for the other uh, universities that I speak to at some of these industry conferences, um, I, I tend to be one of the more uh, longer tenured in my field. Um, just 10 years in college enrollment is a, is a lot. A lot of folks get out of that field pretty quickly. Um, my role there is more educator. And so I'm just trying to uh, strategically uh, find the ways that m most effectively, most simply give them information. Uh, I guess the best way I would say that is making the complex simple. Things that they think are complex, showing them it's not. It's not, it's not as complex as nearly as you think. It really is the simplest. Uh, so those are the strategies I would use across those three audiences. Hmm. One of the things I sometimes uh, have to force myself to remember for this show is that even when coming up with basic advice for new speakers, it's – I, I think a lot, some of this stuff is just come crazy simple and basic and you don't need to talk about that. But that's because I've been living and breathing this stuff for decades. You know, right. folks who are just learning, they don't have that context. The stuff that we think is super simple is not to them. They're smart people. They just don't have the same context and the same, uh, experience that we do. And it's important to keep that in mind. Oh yeah. Um, this is, this is part of one of those strategies I use with folks because I do know that's a response I've been given in my earlier years. Um, well, of course you think this is simple. You know, you're a natural at this, or of course you think this is simple because you've been doing it for this long. Where I, I try to build those folks up is, but guys, I'm not special. I'm not. Like, I've just had a lot of practice. So practice. I've just done a lot of preparation. So prepare. This is nothing special or innate in me that I might be good at it. Uh, these are skills that can be built. It just takes some, some effort and preparation. But it is a good thing to remember uh, when it's trying to explain a complex thing and make it simple is acknowledging to those folks it can be simple. It will be simple if you'll put in the work and preparation to make it that way. Yeah, ab absolutely. And the other thing you, you mentioned there that's so important to emphasize is that it is a skill. It's to, it's a skill. It's something that you can acquire. You don't yes. have to be born to the microphone in grade school like many of us were. You can acquire those skills later in life. You can learn it, and you can be awesome at it. Yeah, I, I've seen that in my own life, where folks who, um, uh, the first time I saw them in a speaking role, it did not go well. But they recognized it. They wanted to be better. They asked for tips. They were humble. They listened. Uh, and I'll give you another one from, uh, I guess, two illustrations from me. In my younger years, I was also in a band. And in the upstate of South Carolina, where we would play, well, we seemed like we were really good. The bands we played with, I was always able to walk off stage to know, yeah, we were probably the best band here. And then we started getting booked in Nashville. And we were playing every weekend in Nashville. And I learned really quickly. 
I am not nearly as good as I think I am. <laughs> like, there's a lot of really talented people I just didn't know because I, I wasn't playing where they played. Same thing happened with me in public speaking, where I saw someone at an event where I just went, he, he is way better at this than I am. Like, he is dominating this room. And so I just wanted to get around him. And h- how did you structure this? How did you come to that comfort level? How do you think you build this rapport with people that I'm okay at, but I'm not nearly as good as you are at it? Uh, and so uh, when it comes to those um, to that development, it's just recognizing where you see talent. And when you see someone's more advanced than you, whether you're very good at it or not very good at it, find those people. Get around them. Let them mentor you in that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of that comes from keeping your own ego in check and keeping in mind the humility with you, with which you need to approach things. And it goes back to that that other saying that that you hear from time to time. And that's that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've certainly have um, in my younger years. I certainly uh, struggled with that where I wanted to be the smart, smartest person in the room. But as I got older, finding I'm not challenged at all. I'm not growing, not getting any better. And so you, you got to find those people who are better, more developed. Uh, and you can, you can help them with some things. They'll help you. Um, and this includes public speaking. You got to find those people, ask them some questions, model what their process is. So, so as you've been going along and finding all these opportunities to speak, you, you've also picked up a local radio gig. How did yes, that sir. happen? <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, that's WLFJ, Christian Talk 660 down here in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, that's that's also grown into a podcast. Um, here, for anyone who ever wants to get into media, this is how I got my show, and this is how you, I would advise folks, uh, I guess, exploring that, that medium. You just have to be willing to do a lot of stuff for free for a while. Because if you are willing to go do stuff for free, eventually some – Opportunity is going to pick up. So uh, at that radio station where they just needed some fill-ins, well, I'll do it. Well, how much are you going to get paid for it? I'll do it for free. I will come in and do that. Uh, when this event or that event or this fundraiser thing needs an MC, uh, well, we're looking for someone to do it. Well, how much do you charge? I'll do it for free. And boy, you start getting opportunities. And that's what happened for me. I was willing to do some things for free for a while, give away my ability for free. And eventually someone comes along and says, you know, we want to give you a platform and we want to make sure you have some way to, to monetize that. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the, I guess the macro story, the, the micro story is um, there was a radio show here in the upstate. And if you know anything in the political world, South Carolina is an early primary state. And so really I'm a, I'm a bit of a nerd, a statistics nerd. And I just knew the map and I knew how the votes worked. And this host didn't want to do the work. He didn't want to dive in on what the turnout rates are going to be. And so, I volunteered at 22 years old. I'll do it. I'll do the work. I'll learn all those statistics. I'll come in and present that information in a, in in a a compelling way on the radio. And that grew into other opportunities again for free, for free, for free until I got my own show. Is that the same path you would take for that today? I think so. I've seen it work for some others, you know, some, some big names I could mention in the media world. uh, That's, that is actually what I learned from them. Was you just for a while until you've built your, built your reputation, you just got to do everything. Do Put yourself out everywhere. Something will hit eventually. You're going to make that connection eventually. Uh, the one place you can't make connections is on your couch. So hmm. just keep putting yourself out there. Right. And for uh, for some folks, too, who may be working for companies that have prohibitions against moonlighting um, or taking a second job while you're working for someone – Doing some things for free while you build that alternative career means you're not violating that moonlighting policy. It's a great point because I have I have run into some conversations with people like that. Well, you know, my boss wouldn't like it or I actually am not allowed. All right. <laughs> well, don't make money off of it. I mean, we're we're living in the media age where all of the guardrails are gone. All of the gatekeepers are gone. You don't need ABC and CBS and Fox to give you a uh, microphone. For that matter, as much as I love my radio station, WLFJ didn't need to necessarily give me that platform because we have this thing called the internet now. Um, so at, at this point, with all of these different mediums, uh, when if you're willing to do some things for free and not get paid for it for a while, uh, man, there's so much opportunity to get yourself out there. 
more than ever, ever before, you have the opportunity to go ahead and create your own stage instead of waiting for someone to give you one. Yeah, of course, we often all bemoan that. You know, <laughs> there are certain uh, folks with stages that you go, how how did this person get 10,000 YouTube views? <laughs> right. It, it happens from time to time. Uh, and so there's a, a, a negative side to everything. Uh, but this is what I find with my high schoolers that I, d- I deal with is they almost find irrelevant what uh, what I found so much so so much value in like I'm 32 and growing growing up for me it still meant something if your show was on one of the four big networks uh, Fox NBC ABC CBS and you weren't on the cable networks cuz those were secondary shows if you right. were on TBS or TNT or USA you're not a big show well, these, that's, not, that's not the world we live in now. Now the biggest shows are on our, our originals from Netflix and Amazon and all that. So even in this world, in media and public speaking, you don't need a stamp of approval from some old school institution. If you're good, you're good. If you're good, there's an audience that will, uh, that will find you if you put enough content out there. I love that I get to, to do media in this age. That's awesome. So, so how does your work there at the, at the radio station and, you know, the, the podcast that comes from that radio station differ from your speaking in front of other audiences? Ah, so, um, so hard if you are a person who feeds off the energy of a room. And I am one of those people. Um, when you tell a joke or say something clever on radio, there is no one to smile at you. Huh. There is no one to chuckle. There's no one to give you any positive reinforcement. You just have to trust the person in their car, the person listening to you in their earbuds and the treadmill reacted the way you wanted to react. And I mean, I listen back to some of my early years because I've now been in radio for the first time I was on air was I was 22 years old. I'm 32 next to 10 years of radio. I was terrible, just terrible. Spoke way too quickly, mumbled a ton. Uh, when I was trying to set up a joke or a point, I would rush it. Uh, so that is the biggest difference. The biggest difference is you just have to trust you're doing an okay job because this podcast I do, I do record it literally in a home studio by myself. My audience is often disinterested dogs, two disinterested <laughs> dogs I have that lay there and they don't laugh at any of my jokes. So the, uh, that's the biggest difference is public speaking gives you that awesome feedback loop and radio does not. I think what you also said something there that's really important for folks who are just starting with speaking or just starting, uh, with their own, um, podcast or even guest getting started in radio or wherever. And that's that, you know, if you look at somebody who's been doing this for a while and think, I can't do that. Go back and listen to their old stuff. Go back and to your favorite podcast. <laughs> listen to episodes one through five. It's not the same show today that it was back then. And you don't get to be as good as you are in episode 100, 150, 200, or year 10 of your radio career without going through year one of your radio career. So true. Like, even though the beginning, I've, I've only had my own show for a little bit less than three years. Before that, I was a fill in on the morning show, I was a fill in on the afternoon show. I was just the, I was the guy off the bench when the main, um, when the main hosts were out just in episode one of my own show to what was most recently episode 133, I'm embarrassed <laughs> by the work I was doing on episode one. Uh, and even cause I was doing my own sound editing, even just editing uh, bumper music and all that. Like I was not good and I'm still not great. I, I, I fully expect to be better five years from now than I am right now. Right. It's that, that can process of continual improvement and to, to get there, you just got to start. Yes. And then not, not, you have to be consistent. Don't get discouraged. Uh, that, that first step, um, you just got to get active, uh, stop having the what ifs and go try, see how it goes. <laughs> That's awesome. So Corey, if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? My uh, initial reaction to that is my Facebook page. I have a Facebook fan page. You can go click like on that. It's just uh, facebook.com slash Corey Truax Show. But I'm also on all the socials. So you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Just look for Corey Truax. There's CoreyTruax.com out there as well. Uh, but the podcast is also one I would push. Um, so that podcast is everywhere. Spotify, SoundCloud, 
iTunes, Apple Podcasts, uh, everywhere uh, podcasts are distributed. You can find the Corey Truax Show and people can find me there. Awesome. And we'll also have all those links available over at 2minutetalktips.com slash Corey Truax. So, Corey, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us this week. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on. One of the key lessons in this conversation is the link between leadership and public speaking. If you become a leader in an organization, no matter how small, you're going to have the opportunity to speak. And the more people see you speaking, the more likely they are to think of you as a leader. And the whole thing can then loop from there. For kids, there are opportunities to lead or to speak in school projects, in clubs, on teams, and and in church. And pursuing those opportunities early often opens up future opportunities for success. And as Corey talks about, often those leadership opportunities can be some of the keys to getting into their preferred schools. Adults aren't shut out of this either, though. There's a reason the Toastmasters, which we talk about a lot on this show, isn't just about speaking, but it's also about leadership. There are opportunities in churches and PTAs. There are committees and cross-functional teams at work. There are condo and homeowners associations and civic groups around the community. To grow as a speaker, try being a leader. And to grow as a leader, try being a speaker. I also like the conversation around the evolving audience. Well, repeating things that made us successful is generally a good place to start. The key word there is generally. Audiences can change and evolve when we're not paying attention, and it's why we should question our assumptions from time to time and ensure they're still valid. Relying on outdated or just plain wrong assumptions can cause problems. On a recent episode of The Real Rx, a podcast hosted by doctors, they talked about aging in women. The official guidelines say that generally women do not need to get pap smears anymore once they pass the age of 60 or 65. The standard is in place because of two assumptions, that women that age do not have sex, and if they do have sex, it's with a long-term partner. The problem is that often both of those assumptions are false, and relying on those false assumptions can lead to a higher risk of cancer. Another example that I've shared before is this. When I used to teach people how to sell laptop computers, I talked about how much more fun it was to sell laptops than it was to sell desktops for a number of reasons, including that once I sold a laptop computer to a customer, I didn't have to then go and lift a big heavy monitor for them. And in the late 90s, that got a laugh. But by 2005, new audiences no longer laughed at that joke. And and why was that? I mean, my delivery and style hadn't changed. Well, it was because the audience changed. Because lightweight flat panel monitors had replaced heavy CRTs in the market. So the joke no longer made sense. You know, a 17-inch monitor no longer weighed 50 pounds. It was just a few pounds. And so it no longer mattered. You see, we have to question our assumptions. There's another story I want to share here. I mean, psychology research is filled with stories about human condition and conformity. Things like the Stanford Prison Experiment, the Milgram Experiment, and of course Pavlov's classical conditioning experiments. And one of the more famous stories we're hearing lately is the story of the Five Monkeys Experiment. Now, in this story, scientists go ahead and they did their experiment with five monkeys in a cage and a ladder and a banana hanging from the ceiling. Now, when a monkey would try to climb the ladder to get the banana, the scientists would spray the rest of the monkeys with water. And they did this a number of times, and eventually, whenever one monkey tried to climb the ladder to get the banana, all the other monkeys would gang up on that one and beat him up and stop him from climbing the ladder. And they continued to do this. Now, scientists gradually began replacing monkeys, swapping them out one at a time. So the first time they did this, now you've got this one new monkey who has never been sprayed with water, uh, but he starts to climb the ladder to go get the banana. Scientists are no longer spraying the water at this point, but the rest of the monkeys that are in there remember being sprayed with the water, and so they go ahead and stop that new monkey from climbing the ladder. And then they substitute another monkey. Meanwhile, the first new monkey has learned that if a monkey tries to climb the ladder, you beat up the monkey. 
and they gradually did this in replacing all the monkeys. So after they replaced all five original monkeys, none of the monkeys in this cage had ever been sprayed with water, had ever had any problem from the outside with getting that banana. However, whenever one of them would try to climb the ladder, the others would beat him up and stop him from doing it. And the scientists theorized that, you know, if you were able to ask these monkeys, why did they beat up that monkey who climbed the ladder? They would have no idea other than, well, that's just the way it is. That's just what you do. This is a classic experiment and story about conformity. It speaks to the evolution of social norms, the origins of etiquette in our society, and the corporate problem of, but we've always done it this way. It's also a great story to tell in discussions about things like tall poppy syndrome or discussions in cultures about how the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. It really says a lot about the human condition and how we learn to do things and we don't question why we do things, why we've always done something a certain way. Uh, does the problem we're trying to solve by doing it this way still exist? Often it doesn't. Here's the other important thing about this experiment. It never happened. That's it. It's just a modern business fable. It's an urban legend. This story never actually took place, but it persists because it speaks to something inside of us. It speaks to an observation we think we've made about the broader culture and about the world that we live in, but it never actually happened. Just like the study that claims people around the world would definitely prefer death to public speaking. Again, that study never said that and was never conducted in that way. You see, it's important to question our assumptions about stories about questioning our assumptions. And whether that's going to be stories about monkeys or jokes that we tell in our presentations or our experiences with what works with audiences as audiences and references change, we've got to keep in mind that those assumptions are things we need to keep questioning. We need to keep doing the work on. And on that note, head on over to 2 com slash Corey Truax. That's C-O-R-Y-T-R-U-A-X to check out all of Corey's links. Share this episode with a friend, colleague, or relative by giving them the link, 2minutetalktips.com slash Corey Truax. Subscribe to 2 Minute Talk Tips for free in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe. And I'll talk to you next week. Two Minute Talk Tips is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.